What Professor Sandel's Harvard lecture teaches us is that students can think for themselves and don't always need to be told what to think and how to think. This lecture also shows us that speaking up, raising your hand and contributing is highly valuable to the class. You don't have to be a student at Harvard to add to the discussion or challenge the professor. All professors like learning and also seeing that their students are thinking critically. The only way they know you're thinking critically is that you are actually engaging in the discussion. And of course, there is usually not a single right or wrong answer. So be brave, stand up and share your opinion. And if you're on the MBE, be prepared to give your opinion to your tutor in your upcoming live online tutorial. We expect you to speak and engage, think critically, tell us what you're thinking. This is a course about justice and we begin with a story. Suppose you're the driver of a trolley car and your trolley car is hurtling down the track at 60 miles an hour and at the end of the track you notice five workers working on the track. You try to stop but you can't. Your brakes don't work. You feel desperate because you know that if you crash into these five workers they will all die. Let's assume you know that for sure. And so you feel helpless until you notice that there is, off to the right, a side track. And at the end of that track, there's one worker working on the track. Your steering wheel works, so you can turn the trolley car, if you want to, onto the side track, killing the one, but sparing the five. Here's our first question. What's the right thing to do? What would you do? Let's take a poll. How many would turn the trolley car onto the side track? Raise your hands. How many wouldn't? How many would go straight ahead? Keep your hands up, those of you who would go straight ahead. A handful of people would. The vast majority would turn. Let's hear first, now we need to begin to investigate the reasons why you think it's the right thing to do. Let's begin with those in the majority who would turn to go onto the side track. Why would you do it? What would be your reason? Who's willing to volunteer a reason? Go ahead, stand up. Um. Because it, it can't be right to kill five people when you can only kill one person instead. It wouldn't be right to kill five if you could kill one person instead. That's a good reason. That's a good reason. Who else? Does everybody agree with that reason? Go ahead. Um, well, I was thinking it was the same reason on 9-11, um, we regard the people who, who flew the plane into the uh, Pennsylvania field as heroes because they chose to kill the people in the plane and not uh, kill more people in uh, big buildings. So the principle there was the same on 9-11. It's a tragic circumstance, but better to kill one and so that five can live? Is that the reason most of you had, those of you who would turn? Yes? After the opening three minutes, the professor invites students to give well-articulated reasons using keywords and examples, and both the female student and the male student 
create relevant examples that the professor uses to highlight the main point of his story. Notice that he engages in conversation with each student individually and seeks answers from both sides of the argument. I need to hear from someone who is in the majority in both cases. How do you explain the difference between the two? Yes. The um, second one, I guess, involves an active choice of uh, pushing the person down, which um, I guess the, that person himself would otherwise uh, not have been involved in this situation at all, and so to uh, choose on his behalf, I guess, to uh, uh, involve him in something that he otherwise would have escaped is, um, I guess, more than what you have in the first case, where the three parties, the, the driver and the, the two sets of workers, are um, already, I guess, in the situation. Go ahead. You can come back if you want. All right. It's a hard question. All right, you did well. You did very well. Here, the professor looks for an opinion from the majority and a student volunteers with a solution that one situation was already happening, so it would be wrong to create another one. But the professor doesn't find this as sufficient. He challenges the student by saying that both people didn't choose to be in that specific situation. The student then tries to give up and sit down, but the professor wants him to answer. So he challenges the student to continue. The student tries by saying to the professor, that's true, but. This is a good start to a response. If you want to respond to a professor in a way that you recognize the truth of what they're saying, but you have a response that could challenge it, you could say, that's true, but. But the guy working, the one on the track off to the side, he didn't choose to sacrifice his life any more than the fat man did, did he? That's true, but he was on the tracks. And you... <laughs> this guy was on the bridge. <laughs> this is a good start to any response. Yet, the professor then cuts him off again and says, but, then the student actually gives up under this level of pressure, even though the professor was trying to engage the student's mind. The professor notices him giving up and doesn't push him further, allowing the student to save face in the situation and saying, Go ahead, you can come back if you want. All right, it's a hard question. All right, you did well. You did very well. It's a hard question. It's a hard question. Don't worry about it. In this case, there wasn't a right or wrong answer. The professor only really wanted the student to think further. But the student became weak once his first answer was insufficient. You should be ready for people to disagree with you and respond accordingly. Giving up when you are confronted with a challenge from the professor limits the discussion and nobody learns anything. Yet, responding and thinking through your answer will highlight your perspective and also help the professor to elaborate or explain the point further. The professor then seeks consensus of the two arguments by inviting multiple students to debate the issue. He puts himself into the moderator role and continues with his line of questioning with the deeper and more complex problems for the students to solve through the discussion. This is a common technique that professors will use. Uh, let's imagine a different case. This time you're a doctor in an emergency room and six patients come to you. Uh, they've been in a terrible trolley car wreck. <laughs> Five of them sustained moderate injuries. One is severely injured. You could spend all day caring for the one severely injured victim, but in that time the five would die. Or you could look after the five, restore them to health, but during that time the one severely injured person would die. How many would save the five? Now is the doctor. How many would save the one? Very few people. In this section, after students get too lost in the specific context of the dilemma, the professor creates an alternative example with the same dilemma. Professors will commonly do this to expand students' thinking laterally. Now consider another doctor case. This time you're a transplant surgeon 
and you have five patients each in desperate need of an organ transplant in order to survive. One needs a heart, one a lung, one a kidney, one a liver, and the fifth, a pancreas. And you have no organ donors. You are about to see them die. And then it occurs to you that in the next room, there's a healthy guy who came in for a checkup. <laughs> and he's... <laughs> you like that? And he's, he's taking a nap. You could go in very quietly, yank out the five organs, that person would die. But you could save the five. How many would do it? Anyone? How many? Put your hands up if you would do it. Anyone in the balcony? You would? Be careful, don't lean over too much. <laughs> what? Uh, how many wouldn't? All right, what do you say? Speak up in the balcony, you who would yank out the organs. Why? I'd actually like to explore a slightly alternate possibility of just taking the one of the five who needs an organ who dies first and using their four healthy organs to save the other four. That's a pretty good idea. In this case, a clever student says, I'd like to actually explore an alternate possibility. This is an excellent way to communicate that the student has thought of a gray area or a possibility beyond the either or black and white that the professor presented. He offers a possible alternative solution that the professor himself hasn't thought of. It's a great idea, <laughs> except for the fact that you just wrecked the philosophical point. <laughs> well, let's, let's step back from these stories and these arguments to notice a couple of things about the way the arguments have begun to unfold. The professor takes it with good humor and praises the student. Some professors might get defensive in this situation because their egos are hurt. But usually, if you can find an argument that they didn't see, professors will be really impressed. Remember, to indicate, just like this young man did, with a phrase, for example, that perhaps there is an alternative way to consider this, or maybe there's another way to think about this. That will indicate to the professor and the other peers that you've thought of a gray area. Except for the fact that you just wrecked the philosophical point. <laughs> With this basic principle of utility on hand, let's begin to test it and to examine it by turning to another case, another story, but this time, not a hypothetical story, a real life story, the case of the Queen versus Dudley and Stevens. This was a 19th century British law case that's famous and much debated in law schools. Here's what happened in the case. I'll summarize the story, then I want to hear how you would rule, imagining that you are the jury. A newspaper account of the time described the background. A sadder story of disaster at sea was never told than that of the survivors of the yacht Minionet. The ship foundered in the South Atlantic, 1,300 miles from the Cape. There were four in the crew. Dudley was the captain. Stevens was the first mate. Brooks was a sailor. All men of excellent character, or so the newspaper account tells us. The fourth crew member was the cabin boy, Richard Parker, 17 years old. He was an orphan. He had no family. And he was on his first long voyage at sea. He went, the news account tells us, rather against the advice of his friends, 
He went in the hopefulness of youthful ambition, thinking the journey would make a man of him. Sadly, it was not to be. The facts of the case were not in dispute. A wave hit the ship, and the mignonette went down. The four crew members escaped to a lifeboat. The only food they had were two cans of preserved turnips, no fresh water. For the first three days, they ate nothing. On the fourth day, they opened one of the cans of turnips and ate it. The next day, they caught a turtle. Together with the other can of turnips, the turtle enabled them to subsist for the next few days. And then for eight days, they had nothing, no food, no water. Imagine yourself in a situation like that. What would you do? Here's what they did. By now, the cabin boy, Parker, is lying at the bottom of the lifeboat in the corner because he had drunk seawater against the advice of the others, and he had become ill, and he appeared to be dying. So on the 19th day, Dudley, the captain, suggested that they should all have a lottery, that they should draw lots to see who would die to save the rest. Brooks refused. He didn't like the lottery idea. We don't know whether this was because he didn't want to take the chance or because he believed in categorical moral principles. But in any case, no lots were drawn. The next day, there was still no ship in sight, so Dudley told Brooks to avert his gaze, and he motioned to Stevens that the boy Parker had better be killed. Dudley offered a prayer. He told the boy his time had come, and he killed him with a penknife, stabbing him in the jugular vein. Brooks emerged from his conscientious objection to share in the gruesome bounty. For four days, the three of them fed on the body and blood of the cabin boy. True story. And then they were rescued. Dudley describes their rescue in his diary with staggering euphemism, quote, on the 24th day, as we were having our breakfast, <laughs> a ship appeared at last. The three survivors were picked up by a German ship. They were taken back to Falmouth in England, where they were arrested and tried. Brooks turned state's witness. Dudley and Stevens went to trial. They didn't dispute the facts. They claimed they had acted out of necessity. That was their defense. They argued, in effect, better that one should die so that three could survive. The prosecutor wasn't swayed by that argument. He said, murder is murder, and so the case went to trial. Now imagine you are the jury. And just to simplify the discussion, Put aside the question of law, and let's assume that you as the jury are charged with deciding whether what they did was morally permissible or not. How many would vote not guilty that what they did was morally permissible? And how many would vote guilty? What they did was morally wrong. A pretty sizable majority. Now let's see what people's reasons are, and let me begin with those who are in the minority. Let's hear first from the defense of Dudley and Stevens. Why would you morally exonerate them? What are your reasons? In this section, the professor puts the students in a mock jury situation to vote on a case. He uses the same technique as before, asking for reasons from both sides of the argument. This will be typical, especially in law schools. What are your reasons? Yes. I think, it's, I think it is morally reprehensible, but I think that there's a distinction between what's morally reprehensible and what makes someone legally accountable. In other words, you know, as the judge said, what's, what's always moral isn't necessarily against the law. And while I don't think that necessity justifies 
theft or murder or any illegal act, at some point your degree of necessity does in fact exonerate you from any guilt. Okay, good. Other defenders, other voices for the defense. Moral justifications for what they did. The young man who answers uses key legal concepts in his argument, reasoning from the law and connecting it to his opinion or his interpretation of legal concepts. The student says, I think it's morally reprehensible. Notice that he says, I think, and also later says, I don't think, before he explains his argument. He's indicating to the professor and the other students that it is his opinion that the act is morally reprehensible. Then he uses his reasoning to explain his opinion. By saying, I think, and I don't think, you are suggesting it is your opinion or interpretation, but also allowing for other opinions. Make sure in a discussion or debate to distinguish between whether what you're saying is a fact or only your opinion. I think, or my opinion is, or I see this as, or I interpret this as, are all phrases you can use to indicate your opinion. It's always moral isn't necessarily against the law, and while I don't think that necessity justifies theft or murder or any illegal act, at some point your degree of necessity does in fact exonerate you from any guilt. Okay, good. Other defenders, other voices for the defense. Moral justifications for what they did. Yes. All right, thank you. Um, I just feel like in a situation that desperate, you have to do what you have to do to survive. Um, you have to do what you have to do. You have got to do what you got to do, pretty much. If you've been going 19 days without any food, um, you know, someone just has to take the sacrifice, someone has to make the sacrifice, and, and people can survive. Right. And furthermore, from that, let's say they survive, and then they become productive members of society who go home and start, like, a million charity organizations and this and that and this and that. I mean, they benefit everybody in the end. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't know what they did afterwards. They might have gone and, like, I don't know, killed more people. Okay, so Marcus, the student wearing a cap, well, there's some problems with this student. He doesn't make eye contact with the professor. Why do you think this may be? Do you think it's helpful or not? Be like, in a situation that desperate, you have to do what you have to do to survive. Um, you have to do what you have to do. You have got to do what you got to do, pretty much. If you've been going 19 days without any food, um, you know, someone just has to take the sacrifice, someone has to make the sacrifice, and, and people can survive. Right. And furthermore, from that, Let's say they survive and then they become productive members of society who go home and start like a million charity organizations and this and that and this and that. I mean, they benefit everybody in the end. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't know what they did afterwards. They might have gone and like, I don't know, killed more people. He gives examples, but he doesn't clearly explain his line of reasoning. He says things like, you have to do what you have to do. You got to do what you got to do, pretty much. We don't know what that really means. Without a reason and good body language, he's not engaging appropriately in an academic discussion. And what do you notice about the speed of his speech and his word choice, the words that he uses? He speaks fast and uses words like this and that and this and that, which don't really mean anything. And furthermore, from that, Let's say they survive and then they become productive members of society who go home and start like a million charity organizations and this and that and this and that. I mean, they benefit everybody in the end. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't know what they did afterwards. They might have gone and like, I don't know, killed more people. He says they may start a million charity organizations. Now this is exaggeration and some people think it's persuasive in an argument, but it isn't, it just sounds silly. How often has someone said to you, I have told you a million times to clean up your room? Choose your words carefully and be specific, not vague. Another example of this is people often use words like always or never when they're presenting an argument. 
don't forget, always and never are 100%. And we can rarely justify using the words always and never. There's usually an exception. We've heard a defense, a couple of voices for the defense. Now we need to hear from the prosecution. Most people think what they did was wrong. Why? Yes. One of the first things that I was thinking was, oh, if they haven't been eating for a really long time, maybe um, they, the, they're mentally like, affected. And so then that, that could be used as a defense, a possible argument that, oh, they weren't in the proper state of mind. They weren't making decisions they might otherwise be making. And if that's an appealing argument, that, that you have to be in an altered mindset to do something like that, it suggests that people who find that argument convincing do think that they were acting immorally. But what do you, I want to know what you think. You defend them. You yeah. vote, I'm no, no, sorry, no, you do. vote to, to convict, right? Yeah, I, I don't think that they acted in a morally appropriate way. And why and, not? What do you say? Here's Marcus. He just defended them. He said, you heard what he said. Yes. That, that, yes. <laughs> that you've got to do what you've got to do in a case yes. like that. Yeah. What do you say to Marcus? That, in, that there's no situation that would allow human beings to take the idea of fate or that the other people's lives in their own hands, that we don't have that kind of power. Good. Okay, thank you. And what's your name? Britt. Britt? Yes. Okay. Who else? What do you say? The following student, Britt, uses good eye contact, but she tries an easy way out of the debate by saying people might. The professor spots this, he doesn't allow it, and he challenges her encouragingly to give her own opinion. He connects her response to the previous student widening the debate. She hesitates and thinks about her words, then gives a clear response. This is what Marcus didn't do. He didn't think about his words. He just carried on speaking. Now, Brit, well, she's much better. It's better to think about what to say rather than say something silly or meaningless. But unfortunately, Brit's response lacks reason. Okay, who else? What do you say? Stand up. I'm wondering if Dudley and Stephen had asked Richard, for Richard Parker's consent in, you know, dying, um, if that would, <laughs> <laughs> would that exonerate them from, from uh, an act of murder? And if so, is that still morally justifiable? That's interesting. All right. Consent. What's, wait, wait. Hang on. What's your name? Kathleen. Kathleen says, suppose they had asked, what would that scenario look like? So in the story, <laughs> Dudley is there, pen knife in hand, but instead of the prayer, or before the prayer, he says, Parker, would you mind? <laughs> We're desperately hungry as Marcus yeah. empathizes with. We're desperately hungry. You're not gonna last long anyhow. Yeah, you can be a martyr. Would you be a martyr? Yeah. How about it, Parker? <laughs> <laughs> then, then would it be, what do you think? Would it be morally justified then? I and don't suppose, think we... suppose Parker, in his semi-stupor, says okay. <laughs> Um, I don't think it would be morally justifiable, but I'm wondering... Even then, even then it wouldn't be. No. You don't think that even with consent, it would be morally justified. Are there people who think, uh, who want to take up Kathleen's consent idea and who think that that would make it morally justified? Raise your hand if it would, if you think it would. Kathleen, the following student, uses reason and chooses her words carefully. The professor challenges her, but with good humour, and she continues to express her views because she feels comfortable, confident and prepared. They're looking at each other and are engaged together in communication. 
He interrupts her once her argument is clear to allow other students to speak. The following student argues from reason that uses logic through numbers. She uses three against one. The professor paraphrases her argument to continue the discussion. She smiles, makes eye contact and is engaged. That's very interesting. Why would consent make a moral difference? Why would it? Yes. Well, I just think that if he was making his own original idea and it was his idea to start with, then that would be the only situation in which I would see it being appropriate in any way. Because that way you couldn't make the argument that he was pressured, you know, it's three to one or whatever the ratio was. Right. And um, I think that if he was making a decision to give his life, then he took on the agency um, to sacrifice himself, which some people might see as admirable, and other people um, might disagree with that decision. So if he came up with the idea, that's the only kind of consent we could have confidence in morally, then it would be okay. Otherwise, it would be kind of coerced consent under the circumstances, you think. The following student looks directly at the professor as she talks to him and stays within the example. She stays on topic. She argues from within this specific context. Again, she smiles and engages. Is there anyone who thinks that even the consent of Parker would not justify their killing him? Who thinks that? Yes. Tell us why. Stand up. I think that uh, Parker would be killed with the hope that the other crew members would be rescued. So there's no definite reason that he should be killed because you don't know who, when they're going to get rescued. So if you kill him, it's killing him in vain. Do you keep killing a crew member until you're rescued and then you're left with no one? Because someone's going to die eventually. Well, the moral logic of the situation seems to be that, that they would keep on picking off the weakest, maybe, one by one, until they were rescued. And in this case, luckily, they were rescued when three at least were still alive. Now, if, if Parker did give his consent, would it be all right, do you think, or not? No. No. It still wouldn't be right. And tell us why it wouldn't be all right. First of all, cannibalism, I believe, is morally incorrect. So you shouldn't be eating a human anyway. So you... <laughs> So cannibalism is morally objectionable as such. So then, even on the scenario of waiting until someone died, still it would be objectionable. Yes, to me personally. I feel like um, it all depends on one's personal morals. And like we can't sit here and just, like this is just my opinion. Uh, of course, other people are going to disagree. But well, we'll see. Let's see what their disagreements are. And then we'll see if they have reasons that can persuade you or not. So it's important to make sure you use relevant examples that highlight your argument and keep your discussion civil and polite and your tone positive. Think carefully about your word choice and don't speak too quickly. Make sure that your audience can understand what you're saying and have time to process what you're saying. And tell us why it wouldn't be all right. First of all, cannibalism, I believe, is morally incorrect. So you shouldn't be eating a human anyway. So you, <laughs> so cannibalism is morally objectionable as such. So then, even on the scenario of waiting until someone died, still it would be objectionable. Yes, to me personally. I feel like um, it all depends on one's personal morals. And like, we can't sit here and just, like, this is just my opinion. Uh, of course, other people are gonna disagree. But well, we'll see. Let's see what their disagreements are, and then we'll see if they have reasons that can persuade you or not. Let's try that. This student says, concept X, I believe, is incorrect. And she says, this is just my opinion. Others will disagree. She is respecting the views of others while giving her own opinion, clarifying that here reasoning is from personal beliefs. This is socially acceptable behaviour, as she is not trying to persuade others to agree with her. 
or saying other opinions are wrong. What about the lottery idea? Does that count as consent? Remember, at the beginning, Dudley proposed a lottery. Suppose that they had agreed to a lottery, then how many would then say it was all right? Suppose there were a lottery, cabin boy lost, and the rest of the story unfolded. Then how many people would say it was morally permissible? So the numbers are rising if we add a lottery. Let's hear from one of you for whom the lottery would make a moral difference. Why would it? I think the essential element in my mind that makes it a crime is the idea that they decided at some point that their lives were more important than his and that, I mean, that's kind of the basis for really any crime, right? It's like my needs, my desires are more important than yours and mine take precedent. And if they had done a lottery where everyone consented that someone should die, and it's sort of like they're all sacrificing themselves to save the rest. Then it would be all right. A little grotesque, but... But morally yeah. permissible? Yes. And what's your name? Matt. So, Matt, for you, what bothers you is not the cannibalism, but the lack of due process. I guess you could say that. Now, this student reasons universally as if truth was clear to everyone. But the professor maintains that it's your view. In this case, the professor is pushing back to say, you're making it sound like it's always true, but really it's only one way to look at it. If someone says, it's your view or that's your perspective, then they will probably be ready with an alternative perspective that may be worth listening to. If they say it's your view but can't present a good alternative, then they are avoiding an agreement with you rather than looking for comparative alternatives. Professors will usually have several alternative arguments for any point made and especially at university, it's important to look at situations from more than one viewpoint. And can someone who agrees with Matt say a little bit more about why a lottery would make it, in your view, morally permissible? Go ahead. The way I understood it originally was that that was the whole issue, is that the cabin boy was never consulted about whether or not something was going to happen to him, even the, with the original lottery, whether or not he would be a part of that. It was just decided that he was the one that was going to die. Right. That's what happened in the actual case. Right. But and if there were a lottery and they'd all agreed to the procedure, you think that would be okay? Right. Because then everyone knows that there's going to be a death, whereas, you know, the cabin boy didn't know that this discussion was even happening. There was no, you know, forewarning for him to know that, hey, I may be the one that's dying. All right, now suppose he, everyone agrees to the lottery, they have the lottery, the cabin boy loses, and he changes his mind. You've already decided. It's like a verbal contract. You can't go back on that. You've decided the decision was made. You know, if you know that you're dying for the, you know, the reason for others to live, you would, if someone else had died, you know that you would consume them, so <laughs> that's right. What, but, I, but then he could say, I know, but I lost. <laughs> I just think that that's the whole moral issue, is that there was no consulting of the cabin boy, and that right. that's what makes it the most horrible, is that he had no idea what was even going on. That had right. he known what was going on, it would be a bit more understandable. All right, good. Now I want to hear, so there are some who think it's morally permissible, but only about 20%. Uh, led by Marcus. <laughs> then there are some who say the real problem here is the lack of consent. Whether the lack of consent to a lottery, to a fair procedure, or Kathleen's idea, lack of consent at the moment of death. So this student uses reasons from the specific case and creates a new argument based on the legal concept of informed consent. 
she doesn't articulate the concept of consent, so the professor fills in her reasoning by naming the concept she is speaking of, i.e. consent. He continues to question her, asking her to elaborate on the argument. She engages in the discussion, although she is having to think quickly to respond, but she does a good job and he acknowledges that. Now I want to hear, so there are some who think it's morally permissible, but only about 20%, uh, led by Marcus. <laughs> then there are some who say, the real problem here is the lack of consent, whether the lack of consent to a lottery, to a fair procedure, or Kathleen's idea, lack of consent at the moment of death. And if we add consent, then more people are willing to consider the sacrifice morally justified. I want to hear now, finally, from those of you who think even with consent, even with a lottery, even with a final murmur of consent by Parker at the very last moment, it would still be wrong. And why would it be wrong? That's what I want to hear. Yes. Well, the whole time I've been leaning all towards the categorical moral reasoning. And I think that there's a possibility I'd be OK with the idea of a lottery and then the loser taking into their own hands to kill themselves um, so that there wouldn't be you know, an act of murder. But I still think that even that way, it's coerced. And um, also, I don't think that there's any remorse. Like in Dudley's diary, we were eating our breakfast. It seems as though he's just sort of like, oh, you know, the, the whole idea of not valuing someone else's life. So right. that makes me be, feel like I have to take the category. You want to throw stand. the book at him? Well, <laughs> when he lacks remorse or a sense of having done anything wrong. Right. So this student's contribution to the discussion shows that she has prepared before attending the lecture. And this benefits her because she knows the type of vocabulary she needs. She knows the concepts that will be discussed. And so she is confident to engage in the discussion. She has the right vocabulary. And therefore, when she speaks, she's speaking with clarity and confidence. Stand up. Why? I think undoubtedly the way our society shaped murder is murder. Murder is murder in every way, and our society looks at murder down, down on it in the same light, and I don't think it's any different in any case. Good. Let me ask you a question. There were three lives at stake mm -hmm. versus one. Okay. The one, the cabin boy, he had no family, he had okay. no dependents. These other three had families back home in England. They had dependents. They had wives and children. Think back to Bentham. Bentham says we have to consider the welfare, the utility, the happiness of everybody. We have to add it all up. So it's not just numbers three against one. It's also all of those people at home. In fact, the London newspaper at the time and popular opinion sympathized with them. Dudley and Stevens. And the paper said if they weren't motivated by affection and concern for their loved ones at home and their dependents, surely they wouldn't have done this. Yeah, and how is that any different from people on the corner trying to have the same desire to feed their family? I don't think it's any different. I think in any case, if I'm, if I'm murdering you to advance my status, that's murder. And I think that we should look at all, that all in the same light. Instead of criminalizing certain uh, activities, and, uh, and, and, and making certain things seem more violent and savage, when in the same case, it's, it's all the same. It's all the same act and mentality that goes into murder, uh, necessity to feed your family, so. Suppose it weren't three, suppose it were 30. 300. One life to save 300. Or in wartime, 3,000. Okay. Suppose well, the stakes are even bigger. Suppose the stakes are even bigger. I think it's still the same deal. Do you think Bentham is wrong to say the right thing to do is to add up the collective happiness? You think he's wrong about that? I don't think he's wrong, but I think murder is murder in any case. Yeah, well, then Bentham has to be wrong. If you're right, he's wrong. OK, then he's wrong. All right. right. <laughs> Thank you. Well done. So this next student gives his opinion, but tries to sit down quickly. 
the professor doesn't let him go that easily and adds a follow-on critical thinking challenge by arguing from the opposite perspective and giving reasons and specific examples. The student engages with the challenge with confidence and uses a general principle to counter the professor's examples. He successfully maintains his position even though the professor has to push him to finally say so. Going back and forth between general principles and examples is a common way to have a rich and challenging discussion with your professors and your peers at university. What Professor Sandell's Harvard lecture teaches us is that students can think for themselves and don't always need to be told what to think and how to think. This lecture also shows us that speaking up, raising your hand and contributing is highly valuable to the class. You don't have to be a student at Harvard to add to the discussion or challenge the professor. All professors like learning and also seeing that their students are thinking critically. The only way they know you're thinking critically is that you are actually engaging in the discussion. And of course, there is usually not a single right or wrong answer. So be brave, stand up and share your opinion. And if you're on the MBE, be prepared to give your opinion to your tutor in your upcoming live online tutorial. We expect you to speak and engage, think critically, tell us what you're thinking. Before moving on to the next lesson, brainstorm a major problem in the world and the language that is used to discuss it. Make a mind map of the keywords used to discuss the problem and be ready to discuss the problem in your tutorial. You are going to need this mind map for the next lesson where you will create your essay outline on the theme you have chosen. So choose a problem you really care about because you are going to write 2,000 words about it and you're also going to need to discuss this with a real professor on the MBE.